give me a thumbs up. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, you probably know my name is Johnny King. And looking at some of the participants, as I said, I recognize some names, maybe not others. And if I'm not recognizing your name, that just means I'm having some kind of brain synapse problem if I met you. But anyway, glad to hang out with you and Ty. Um, I tie all kinds of flies from trout to stripers to steelhead to millions of different species. So what I wanted to do tonight is focus on a style of tying um, based on a fly originally called the kinky muddler and show you different ways to apply it. We're going to start out with a squid fly, which I know Anthony likes and uses. It looks like Anthony's got one sitting in his vice. That's probably one Anthony tied. Um, oh no, apparently it's one I tied. Um, and um, and that's a bit of an involved fly, so we'll try to get through that. But what, if we have time, I'd like to show you other ways to tie other flies using this technique. So this is a kinky muddler squid fly. It looks a little bit like the, the one in Anthony's vise. Um, and it'll illustrate the techniques. Typically when I've demonstrated this pattern, I've demonstrated a basic saltwater bait fish, like a mullet, or I tie a lot of them for sardinas down in Baja. But I have used this style of tying for many different things. So for instance, my favorite trout streamer is a little tube fly like this. I don't know if you guys can see it. So if we have time for that, we'll tie these and um, I'll show you also how you can use some tube fly components. By the way, the squid fly has that. Um, this is on a hook. That's a little matuka for trout and bass. That's also a kinky muddler, if you can see that head there. Um, Here's another tube fly. This is tied with my buddy David Nelson's squimpish fibers. Here is a zonker, tied kinky muddler style. So I've yet to, and there are plenty of other ones here. Here is, I guess what you would call this is, it's got a deceiver tail, a woolly bugger body, and a kinky muddler head. So I guess my point is that this is a pretty versatile tying technique and it'll teach you how to create three-dimensional um, bodies in your flies. And that's very important to how I, uh, like to tie because I'm an imitative tire. I tend to match the hatch. So no better way to match the hatch than squid flies. Um, about 15 years ago, I was at one of these shows, or maybe I was on the beach, and I ran into my old friend Kenny Abrams. I bet you guys, some of you guys know Kenny Abrams who helped popularize flat legs. And Kenny would always, you know, dispense his wisdom in mysterious ways. And as he left whatever this event was, he said to me, do me a favor, fish squid flies. So he's a big proponent of it. So I started fishing him in New York Harbor. New York Harbor's messy, really see squid. And we were tattooing the fish. And what I realized is I'd catch a bluefish, right? And it would cough off some nondescript whatever, broken up bait fish and stuff. But I started to realize that there were pieces of squid in them. And then every so often I'd be fishing a clouser and hook a squid. This could be May. This could be November. I was at Montauk fishing the Albi run once. And I had a squid come up and take a swipe at my Albi fly. So they are always around and stripers really like them and they have a very distinct profile. And most important, they're three dimensional creatures, right? You can't tie a flat squid fly, like a bunker might be flat side to side. Uh, a squid is very three dimensional. So this technique helps you tie that squid fly. Now, one of the things about a squid is you gotta get the proportions right. You'll see lots of squid where it has a little tiny short body and then long tentacles. And that's exactly wrong because the, for the kind of squid we're imitating, frankly, for most squid, including down in the Caribbean, the body, which we call the mantle, is about, including the head, is about two thirds of the length, let's say a, like a northern short fin, uh, long fin squid, and the tentacles are maybe one third with some variation. And that's generally true. So you need to find a way to get your tentacles back here, and that's where the fly is going to move, and then have your body be the elongated part of the fly. But you also don't want to use a super long shank hook. Lost the biggest striper of my life on a long shank hook. So I'm going to show you a way to get an extension. Some of you may be, and you could do this on, um, on mono. I'm going to get fancy here and use um, a tube fly component. So this is a pro sport fisher tube, and you see it has two diameters. I cut it off at the end there. We're not going to use this as a traditional tube fly because we're just going to bind this to the back of the shank. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this onto my tube fly needle. And then these pro sport fisher tubes come with all kinds of doohickeys. This happens to be a little orange bead. I'm going to slide it on back there. But if you don't have this, you can just tie it off the back of the hook or you can use a piece of 100 pound monofilament. But I figured I'll show you guys sort of maximum different ways we could do this. 
I like to use mono thread. This is fine uni mono. You can also use, what's that? Uh, UTC mono. I just like it to be fine. You have to have a gentle touch and there's a good chance I'll break my thread. But let's get started and get that mono on the shank. The reason I put that bead in there is for two purposes. One is it's going to help spread the tentacles and head. Second of all, it's nice to have a little weight in the squid fly. I tied this one with no weight. And unless you're fishing it on a, uh, an intermediate line, it's fairly densely packed. It's going to almost float. Sometimes that's great, right? You go to see squid in the marshes like in, uh, like in uh, uh, Connecticut, where I fish, Western Connecticut, Long Island Sound. Sometimes they'll be flitting around in, you know, two feet of water. But sometimes you want to get it down, so you need to put a little weight off the back end. So what we'll do is we're going to create the head and the tentacles out of various different items. I have here, I happen to not be home. I only have some of my, uh, my uh, uh, materials, but I happen to grab some of this brownish craft fur. I'm just going to take off a clump of this craft fur. Now, typically when people tie with craft fur, they preen out all the under fur, but I want that bulk there because that's going to help me establish the dimensions of the head. And I also don't want it to go too far back. So what I'll do is I'll strip out the longer fibers and align them, shorten this thing up because I'm going to put something over this. I'm going to put some saddle. So I'm going to trim that back. We're going to tie probably a squid fly that's in the kind of five, six inch range, which is a good general purpose. Sometimes you need bigger ones. Bigger ones are a little harder cast and there might be better patterns for that. So if you guys can see, I have a nice kind of dense tuft of maybe two, two and a half inches of craft fur. I'll lay it right in front of that bead, right? And trap it with maybe one or two wraps of thread. That's all I need. Then I'm gonna use my fingers and loosen the thread. I've got two there to manipulate the craft fur all the way around the tube. Looks like I missed a little there, but if you guys can see, it's basically creating an even collar. So if any of you have tied hollow flies, you can also tie these things in reverse where you have them pointing forward and you fold them back on themselves. But now I have a nice weighted back section for the head. That to me is not enough for tentacles. As we all know, squid change colors on a dime and they have pinks and reds and whites. I saw a great video that Bob Popovic sent me of a bunch of squid looking milky white and gray. This is in the Caribbean, but they're the same similar type of squid to what we have. These are called reef squid. Barracuda comes. All the squid instantly orient themselves in the position of the coral. They become brown and there's some, there's some stag coral on the bottom. They position themselves like that and they become the exact color of the coral. The barracuda swims away. They all jet up, take on their regular colors and swim away. So because they have these things called chromatophores, they can change at any time. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some hackles and surround this head assembly. Now you're going to say, where do you get the fancy hackles? This is actually a dry fly neck because I tied dry flies. But you can use saddles. You can use hen feathers. There are, this is for tying, you know, size 18 and 16 emergers. But the very bottom of this neck, I have these nicely modeled kind of grizzly ginger colored saddles. And I don't need to put them in um, neatly. Squid, I think, has eight tentacles. So what I'll do is I'll put these in to surround the uh, craft fur. And I'll, I don't care if they're a little, they're sticking out at different angles because that'll all increase the movement of the fly, right? So I can even take uh, maybe one or two at a time, put one here. I can make them shorter, longer. I could pull off and all. If I have a pink saddle, I happen not to have one. I'll throw some pink in there, red, throw one here. Just make sure they don't extend too far behind the tips of the crafter, which remember, not too, too long, right? So those are getting in my tying way. Let's get rid of those. Grabbed a few more. Tie these in. If you guys have ever seen a Bob Popovic's temp, uh, Semper fly, he likes to tie them in that way. But look at all those mixed colors. And because they're a little flared out, when you strip this squid, those tentacles are going to move really well. The thing is, if you observe a squid, there's only two parts of a squid that move. The body is completely rigid. It's the tentacles and then the little swim fins up front. Swim fins are hard to duplicate, but you can do it. We're not gonna bother on this fly. You could wrap some marabou up the front. Um, but the main thing is to get that movement in the back half. So I think I had eight here. So we'll have the exact number of tentacles a real squid does. And if you notice, I'm just doing one or two wraps, right? I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. 
And there you go. So now check that out. We have it nicely distributed around there. It's almost like for any of you guys who tie steel head flies, it's almost like the back of an intruder, but I just use that little orange bead in there that fit over my tube to, um, to spread the, the uh, materials. There's another material that I'll introduce you guys to. It's called Senyo's Predator Wrap. It's just a barred, and it comes in barred colors. It's a barred flashy material, but it captures the barring and spots of a squid. It comes in orange, it comes in greens, blues. I happen to have just the black and white here, but I always think it looks nice to add some movement to the back half of the fly and also to um, increase the breakup of the colors because squid are almost never uniform colored. Now that's gonna be too long, right? I don't want it going back there. So what I'll do is I'll cut it um, unevenly, right? I'll just randomly cut shorter and longer pieces. I don't, I don't care about anything uniform in there. Then I will take that, I could wrap it around because it has a backing, but I'm gonna make it even simpler. I'm just gonna lay it over the top there, spread it around, and I'm good to go. Look at how cool that looks. This stuff is great, this predator wrap. It's great on trout flies. It's great on streamers. Um, and it's not super duper flashy. It's kind of translucent. So it'll really call out the back of that squid. So there we go. Now we got the tentacle assembly. We got to put a head on that thing. And if you look um, at the, uh, sorry about that, the head of a squid, um, I don't have a picture here, but I would encourage you, just do a Google image search for long fin squid. Um, and by the way, I'll remind you, um, Anthony can see you, I can't, um, but if you guys have any questions you want to ask during the course of it, you let Anthony know either by raising your hand or notifying him with the little chat feature, and I'm happy to answer these questions as I'm going along. But I'm going to need to create a little head on this before I tie this off on the back of a hook shank. So what I'm gonna use is, you can use kinky fiber. I'm using a material called sculpting flash fiber. This is much finer than kinky fiber and it sinks much better. And I particularly like it, this is a rusty color. What do they call that? I think they call it rusty olive or redfish or something, but it's kind of got that brownish color. So what you do is you take, and you don't have to be fancy with this at all. You take out a decent sized hank, right? And I usually fold it over because I wanna create a couple of tie-ins here to create some bulk. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a little cylindrical head, just like a real squid. So we're gonna take this tuft. You can see, I don't know, that's maybe a pencil width, maybe a little bigger. This stuff's very compressible, right? And I'm gonna tie it in V style. Let me show you. And that's, gonna, what's, that's what's gonna happen for the whole rest of the fly. I tie it in like this. I'm gonna angle it so it's at 45 degrees. Maybe it'd be easier to show you guys like this. That's how I'm gonna tie it in. And I'm gonna fold the outer piece back to create a V. So let's see how that's done. This is the easiest thing in the world, but it's a little different than the typical high tail where you tie it on top and fold it back. So here you go. Got my, got my angle, 45 degrees. The near side is sweeping back here. The far side heading towards you guys is angled out that way. Give it one or two wraps. That's all I need. I don't need a lot of pressure. I'm going to fold this piece back on itself and trap that with a few wraps. And if you'll notice what that do, does is, or maybe you can see it better from the bottom, I've created a V of materials on top of the hook. That way, I'm not just creating dimension up and down, I'm creating it side to side. And what I'm gonna do now is flip the fly over, the tube over, and do the same thing on the bottom, create that V. One, two, three, hold it back. One, two, three. Okay, that's the first tie. Now, obviously, that's too much material. We're going to trim that out. But let's see, if do I want to do any other colors? Eh, we'll stick with this color. Sometimes I like to switch up colors. Maybe we'll do that on the mantle of the fly. A lot of times you'll see sort of gray alternating with brown, rust. If there's one color that I most closely associate with squid. It is, um, it's rust. Um, my friend Jeff Becker, who's a guy down in um, Long Island Sound, always says they're brown. He always says, tie me a brown squid. So anyway, we're going to advance the thread to a head of that bump. And if you see that bump, it's big and ugly. Don't worry about it. It's going to get covered up with all this material. Here's what we're going to do. One, two, fold it back. One, two, fold it back. Grab the excess here. As you can see, this uses a fair bit of material, but we're going to trim a lot of that out. 
flip it over. One, two, fold it back. One, two, fold it back. So now we're getting roughly the dimensions of a head and I just need to finish this thing off. I'm not too worried about this head, this part being looking neat because it's all gonna be buried. There's a messy, I don't know if you can see, but inside there, there's a messy little joint, but it's covered because the material's coming off the hook shank, um, uh, uh, sweep back and cover it. But if you wanna make it a little neater, one thing you can do is rather than doing the V ties, get ourselves one more hank here, you can do top and bottom ties and fold them back at the same time. I'll show you exactly what I mean. You take this stuff, right? Another hank, similar. Put it directly on top of the hook shank. Trap it with two wraps of thread. Leave it, don't fold it back. Take the remaining material, flip the hook over. And you always have to do two wraps because if you do one wrap and then you turn your hook shank, it's gonna come cascading down. That's happened to me a million times. It tends to happen to me when I'm doing fly tying pellets. But anyway, put that on there. One, two, and then you're good. Now what I'm gonna do, notice I haven't folded anything back. I'm gonna fold them back at the same time, like this. I, this is a little cylinder, but if I didn't have it, I could use my fingers. I just have a little more control when I use that cylinder. Use a pen casing or a plastic straw, you know, get one that has a little more body to it like they use in water bottles. So I folded that back, put this down. Fold that back, right? and just wrap in front of it. And because I'm wrapping in front of it, eventually it's gonna stay in place. Use a lot of thread, but keep on wrapping. Don't wrap over it like that. If you guys can see, I'm not pinching it down that way. Rather, I'm creating a dam of material to push it back on itself. So in other words, as I wrap the thread and increase the diameter of the area I'm wrapping, it's creating a, essentially a ramp or dam of thread. And look, it's all, leaning back now like I want it. Oops. Okay, so that is the basic head assembly. Then what you do is you tie this stuff off. I use a hand whip finish. If you want, you could put a little super glue on that. We won't worry about that now or a little head cement. Now the thing is, so we're done with the tube fly part of this. We'll take that needle out of the vise. Well, I'll leave it on for the moment because maybe we'll trim. Now I need to trim, I need to leave that tentacle um, material, but trim, so I grab the craft fur, the laser, uh, the Senyo's Predator wrap, and the saddles. And then what I start doing is I trim out the head. The way I do it is I take this device, this little assembly, and I squeeze it side to side. That helps me align all these fibers. And I trim them off right about there. Just like trimming a deer hair bass bug, you might take your razor blade, do that. Flip that over, do the same thing. Trim it off right about there, making sure not to cut any of the actual tentacle materials. So you can see now I've got a smooth cut there and a smooth cut there. Now I'm gonna do the same thing side to side. Um, I'm gonna, and when you squeeze it side to side, before we squeeze it this way, right now it's 360 degrees, but you can align the fibers like that and trim them out. Got it? Any questions? So now we have reduced that to a manageable head and we'll just taper out those materials and we can glue on some eyes. Now, people have a tendency, sometimes what I like to do, by the way, is if I have too many stragglers back there, I'll grab all this material and I'll bring my scissors up into this. I'll sweep it up like this, and then I can get rid of it and make the head roughly an even kind of ball, if you will, around the, uh, the shank or the, 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 the diameter of the tube. So now, you can see back in there, I've got that little bead hidden in there. No one's gonna see that. And since it's orange, to the extent it bleeds through, it's a good color to bleed through. You've got that cool looking assembly. And once you have, if you put it back on the mandrel, you could just do this, trim it as you go around to make a nice cylindrical shape. So obviously we've only, the truth is you could probably fish that thing, stick a hook in that thing and fish. 
but we're going to make a fancy squid fly. These are not flies. I, I'm making a whole project of this. These are not flies you crank out in, in 10 minutes, but if I wasn't talking my way through it, maybe it'd be 20 minutes. But you know, you don't use squid flies all the time. It's not like a clouser or a deceiver where you just crank it out. So there we have a nicely tapered head. I'm pretty satisfied with that. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna glue some eyes on it. Now I don't have the glue that I really like to use on this. I use, like to use the stuff called E thousand or goop. Didn't bring it with me when I fled New York City to a relative's house two months ago. Um, you guys can probably guess why I did that. But I have some super glue that my wife got me at the uh, local supermarket. Um, and what I'll do is I'll put a little bead there. That's gel super glue, by the way, and a little bead there. Now, with respect to squid eyes, people tend to put enormous eyes on them. But check out a squid. They're not that big, their eyes. What they are is conspicuous. They have a big white round section with a little black ball. So I don't want my eyes to cover up that whole head. I want the eyes to be about that dimension. That might be a little smaller than I would ideally choose. It's what I got. I'm using, these are flat eyes. These are not dome eyes. They're made by Pro Sport Fisher as well. You can tell I'm a fan of their materials and they're called cool eyes. I think, um, pretty sure you guys have met the bear's den. They are, um, is that true, Anthony? Yeah. They are, they're realistic eyes, but they're flat. And I prefer that. I don't like being forced to dome up eyes when I don't want to. And because they're flat, they're flexible. So when I'm using a bigger eye, I can kind of bend them to conform to the shape. But there's the head of the squid, right? Simple, basic thing. And that's going to move like, you can imagine what that's going to look like in the water. It's going to look just like the back half of the squid. So now what we're going to do is we're going to tie the rest of this sucker on a hook. So what you need is a long shank hook, but long shank hooks in general are not good for holding fish. I've started to like what people are called predator hooks. Partridge makes some things called predators. Umqua made a really high quality version called a beast hook. This is a four out. Well, you see about that hook is, it's got a decently long shanks, certainly longer than your typical, you know, O'Shaughnessy hook that you might use for a clouser but it's not too long and it's got this big round bend. So because of that gape, right? First of all, the fly is gonna track properly. It's not gonna spin because that's got that weight to anchor it and to make it track properly. Second of all, these hooks are strong and leave lots of room for you to tie, right? Without blocking the hook shank, right? Because we're gonna tie a whole bunch of material in there. So, Here's one of, the, one of the things that I'm missing is I usually like to take the end of this tube and mash it with a pair of pliers. Sadly, I have no pliers, so I'm gonna mash it with my teeth. That is not recommended, but what I did is I flattened that out so I can tie it on top of the hook chain. So let's get our thread. I'm still using the mono thread. I got my hook in there. And by the way, with respect to the strength of these hooks, some, they were made for pike. But I have tied these for my friend James, who is the owner of James Shaughnessy, who's the owner of Beulah Fly Rods, and he's caught a marlin on these hooks on squid by the side. I want to show you a trick. I just tied in, let's go back and do that again. Everyone has their own way of doing what they call a jam knot to, to attach the thread to a hook, right? So you fold it back over itself. Then people say, oh, hold on, I got to go find my scissors. I don't bother. I just do this. I wrap on it, wrap in, a few, in the same place a few times, and then snap it off like that. And as long as the thread is not gel spun or something, you can snap off only, almost any thread without disturbing the thread wraps you already have on there. So you guys see that squid, right? We'll go back to the bitter end of the hook shank, tie in some thread wraps, and we will take that tube and wrap it down. Now remember, I floops, it's a little cockeyed, so we're gonna have to adjust it. So you guys can see better than me. How's that eye looking? That eye's looking like it's oriented properly. And if you see, I've, I've trapped that flattened tube there. Now it is a little, little section of hollow tubing, which has a tendency to float, but that will be completely counteracted by that heavy orange bead that I put in there. And again, the other way to do this, you guys, is just tie your saddle hackles and your fur right off the bend of the hook. But look at the proportions, they're gonna be better now, right? Because, um, because I now have that head way back there so that this, that the mantle from here to here will be longer than this. 
it looked like someone typed in a question, um, but it came and it disappeared. Let's see. Um, any hook suggestions if you're going tuna spec? We often run into 30, 90. Yeah, that's a good question for two to four inch squid. I have a, yeah, there's a great hook. It's just not that easy to find. Varavas makes a hook called a nine. I'm not sure I can find you guys some, but it's a long shank version of its hook and it's about this long and it's got an extremely strong bend. Um, the old Tiemco 911S was a really strong hook. You can't get those anymore. Um, but I'll tell you what's our super strong hook and I think would hold a yellow fin. I mean, although you're talking about yellow fin, 30 to 90 pounds, is owner or gamakatsu spinnerbait hooks, which have, uh, have um, dimensions like this. The owner one in particular is extremely strong and extremely sharp. You know, you t to tell you the truth, I rarely see them in fly shops um, um, and you can find them at tackle stores. I, you know, Scott and Anthony have a ton of stuff there, but these owner spinnerbait hooks are outstanding. So you guys got that, that's the assembly. So what we're gonna do now is, we're gonna switch over to kinky fiber, which is a little bit coarser material than what we used for the, wow, we're already half an hour into it. <laughs> um, it's a little coarser material than we use for the head. And we're gonna do a series of V-ties up the shank. So I have rainbow, I have white, and this is called rusty camel. Use whatever you like, mix them. So here, I'll grab some rainbow and maybe I'll take some rusty camel and put it in there. It all works. You don't have to worry about blending it. It's okay if it's uneven. If you're concerned that it's not mixed properly, what I suggest you do is get a comb, like this little metal comb, and start it through. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get right on top of where we tied in that tube stuff. Maybe trim a tiny bit of that. And we're gonna start doing V-ties top and bottom. And you're always gonna wanna use more material than you need. You're gonna find that you're gonna trim half this stuff away. But note that when I do my V-ties, I'm gonna have them extend to almost covering the eyes. We'll trim them out. But you want this body to flow back into that head assembly. So the one, two, remember I got it at a 45 degree angle. Flip it over on itself, one, two. That's all the wraps I do. I don't need any more pressure. The way you make a durable fly is not to crank down on your thread, it's to have properly placed thread wraps. I'm gonna to go to the same spot, do the same deal, one, two. Hold it back on itself. Get the thread, one, two. That's all we need, right? And what's amazing about these flies is you're thinking this guy's using fine mono thread. I remember somebody on some online thing said, your flies must fa fall apart. I, I tied one of these for that caught, um, if any of you have ever caught a rooster fish, those fish are no joke. Caught 17 rooster fish, including a world record in the 70 pound range, and was still going strong. The eyes hadn't even fallen off of it. So these are very durable flies. We'll keep doing the same thing. I've got enough here to probably squeak out maybe one or two more applications. Same deal. One thing also, by the way, is uh, squid, like bait fish, it's a little bit of a different principle, sometimes have a tendency to be lighter colored on the bottom than the top. Sometimes they'll color up on the top. So if you want to use a lighter application of hair, on the bottom, that's okay. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some rainbow and I got some white, I'm gonna comb them together. You have to flip this over, same deal. It's a little thicker, Hank, doesn't matter. We'll trim this all down. This fly, the first time you tie it, I know Anthony's tied some. First time you tie this fly, it's gonna be a complete and total disaster. Um, I, uh, it's a fly that, in fact, I walked, if any of you know Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis, I did a podcast with him where he tied it and he announced in the beginning, he said, I want everyone to know that I can't tie this fly. I tried it five times and it sucked. So then I sat there and walked him through it and he tied a beautiful kinky muddler. It's the kind of thing where your first two, three, four are going to be a disaster. And then all of a sudden it's going to click. And I have, it is not a hard fly to tie. I have proven that to myself time and time again. And look at how messy I'm being. I've got thread wraps, clumps. It doesn't matter because all this stuff is gonna get covered over. So flip it over. I don't know, I'm just curious. I don't know if people can say yes or no. Have any of you ever tied deer hair bass bugs? Let's see. Uh, if any of you have tied deer hair bass bugs, you'll, you'll, I used to do them, those bass bugs, like, you know, Pat Cohen, I'd, I'd mix 10 million colors, I'd work them over, and it's a very redundant process. 
This is sort of similar to that. So we're getting there. There's no different, but what I like to do is I like to just have a whole bunch of different colors at my disposal to add. As you can see, there's nothing fussy about this. There's lumps. We're going to take care of all that mess once we get to the head of the ply and we trim it. So now I've taken some more of this. Since I have a couple of bands of uh, lighter color, um, I'm going to contradict myself. And before, I'm going to mix a little rainbow with a little of this camel color. I'll put that on the bottom. What I like is variegation. So I'm a dry fly tire. I buy saddles. I almost never buy anything that's a uniform color. Like when I buy dry fly necks, I never buy a brown. I buy a grizzly variant or things that have splotches because my experience has always been there are very few animals in nature that have uniform colors. And there's nothing that has less of a uniform color than a squid when it wants to. Sometimes it'll just have that milky way. By the way, when you see them dead and looking that kind of generic whitish color, that's not how they are in the water. If any of you have ever seen them lit up in the rips or, um, um, I don't know, Anthony, can you unmute yourself for a second? Sure. So uh, you fish a lot of squid flies. Do you, do you fish them in the, in the canal? Uh, sometimes, yeah. And do you see squid passing through the canal sometimes? Yeah, and usually they're very orangish, reddish brown color that uh, they seem to get when they're scared. Exactly, right? So your basic, you don't want, you want your skid, you want your squid to look like it's freaking out a little bit. And, exactly. um, and, um, but so, so, and a lot of times you fish them even when you're not seeing squid, right? Oh yeah, definitely. The, it seems like the, at least stripers anyway, the, I don't know if they think they're an easy meal or uh, they just love them so much, but uh, yeah, you throw a squid fly out there and they, they're going to hit it from what I've seen. Yep, I, that was great advice that, that Kenny Abrams gave me um, however many years ago. So, so that's kind of my point is you kind of got to have faith in doing it. And there are simpler squid flies to tie than these, but, but if, let's say you nail this and you crank out five of these, you could go a whole season using them. I mean, unless they get bit off by a bluefish, they will not fall apart. So you can see, you guys, and I'm getting close to the hook shank. I'm just using some rainbow color now. Use whatever you want. By the way, the other thing is, just get yourself some white. You can use, um, you can use this kinky fiber. You can use Farrar blend. Uh, Bears Den used to sell. I think you still sell some stuff called Sinyak, very similar material. You just get some white and uh, grab some markers and marker it up, and you'll have all the color you need. Sometimes I'll take a red or orange marker and put dots on these things. Um, as we approach the hook eye, though, I do want to show you guys a slight change in the procedures. So, I don't know how well you can see it, but we're getting pretty close to the hook eye there. I've got maybe, after this little lump, I've maybe got room for one more narrow application of the material, and then we'll change up the procedure. So, what I'll do is, you can see I'm really packing it in. By the way, particularly when you're using kinky fiber, the more material you pack in, the more dense you make this body, the, um, the more buoyant the fly is going to be. It's going to trap more water, uh, more air. Um, however, if you use that other material that I mentioned before, the sculpting flash fiber, which we use then, you can tie the whole body out of that. It's a little softer, doesn't keep its shape as well. That stuff sinks like a rock. Um, it sort of has the texture of like Enrico Puglisi fibers, but for which are very buoyant. But for whatever reason, sculpting flash fiber really wants to sink once it gets wet. And I don't find it hard to cast either. It's pretty remarkable stuff. So there we go. We pretty much, a little messy, but we pretty much filled up towards the hook eye. Now we're going to change the procedure a bit. Because what we're going to do is, if you remember when we finished the head of the squid, of the squid what we did is, Right, we did the V ties, and then the last ties we just put top and bottom. Now you're going to see the real reason to do that. I'm just going to use the brown, so this has got a little brown nose on it. And by the way, you can always leave a little room at the front of the fly if you want, and you can take a couple of marabou feathers or a big schlappen feather, and those will function like a kind of like a pair of swim fins. I don't find it necessary, and I find they tend to get a little tangly. It's more stuff to absorb water, but it looks pretty cool. I've even fit swim fins with fox fur tied individually between these these uh the, these uh v ties but that's 
that's more like for a presentation fly. Um, so here we are, we're almost at the hook eye, got this brownish camel stuff. I'm just gonna take it, put it on top of the hook and pinch it exactly at the little neck of the hook eye. I'm not leaving any room. I, in other words, I'm doing what you're always told to do when you learn to tie flies, which is I'm crowding the hook eye. But there's a reason for that. I'm gonna flip it over, do the same thing, right? One, two, let's get some stuff there. Okay, so now I got all that material trapped right in that tiny little valley. What am I gonna do with it now? Now I've got that mess. Now I'm going to, if I can, uh, I guess I misplaced my little pushing tool. Ah, here it is. I'm gonna take this, and this is like tying a hollow fly or a bulkhead deceiver. I'm gonna push the top and bottom segments of material back simultaneously. I don't know, maybe I can adjust this a little, but if you guys can see, there's nothing there. There's literally just the hook eye protruding, protruding, protruding from that material. I'm then gonna take my thread and get it in front of it. Now, obviously, if I let that go, that's gonna all wanna pop forward. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use my fingernail to distribute that material, and I'm gonna do that same deal where I create a dam of thread up front. So let's see. So I'm not wrapping back on the material. I'm not doing that, right? I don't want to do that because I don't want to compress it. But what I'm doing is I'm putting pressure. I'm ramping up the thread. You know something? I'm trying to think. If you guys ever tied, I wonder if there are any trout tires here who ever tied a comparadon. You tie deer hair facing over the hook eye, and you have to force it back. You don't wrap on the butts of the deer hair. You wrap in front of it and put dubbing in it. So you're folding the material back on itself. The result of that is that this squid is not gonna have, just like any bait fish I tie, is not gonna have any beak up front, right? We're not tying a half beak, we're not tying a needle fish, which is a long skinny nose. We want to occupy the entire hook shank. And look at that, it's laying back just like I wanted to. A Couple of tricks with this. If I just wrap back and don't go forward periodically, I will get what my, frat, my friend uh, Brad Buzzy calls the avalanche effect, because uh, mono thread is very springy. All of a sudden go boom and a million coils will spring out over the hook eye. So what you want to do is wrap back, get in tight, and then wrap back down to the hook eye. If you look though, I've still got plenty of room in that hook eye. I could get a, a piece of 100 pound test in there if I needed to, or wire, whatever. Okay, I think we have that back far enough. But what's cool about that is that's back, but I don't have a big ugly head on that fly. This, you know, this is like Atlantic salmon, fancy fly tire technique. I have a nice tiny little head. Another trick with mono thread, I do a whip finish with my hands or if you use um, just a half inch, do multiple whip finishes. Mono thread, like I said, is very springy. Sometimes you'll nick it when you're cutting. So I'll usually do one, two, three. I think that's my third or fourth whip finish, but I'm not adding much bulk, right? Because I'm only using whatever this is, tiny little fine mono. Now that's pretty secure in there and you can always add some glue over. So now, how do we take this monstrosity, right, and turn it into this lovely little squid? We gotta trim it. And we're gonna use the same principles we learned from trimming the head. And I think, um, gotta make sure that you guys can see it. But what, if you'll look, I got all kinds of crazy fibers sticking out here, right? I mean, that's not a proper squid. So what I'll do is I'll preen all those fibers out and I will squeeze this sucker, top to bottom, right, squeezing it. The reason I'm squeezing it is that forces all that material out to the sides. Then I can use my fingers and my thumb as essentially a cutting guide. So as an initial cut, I'll go one, two, three, four, five. Get all that nonsense out of there. Flip it around in my hands. Look at how much excess material I have there. One, two, three, four. Okay, so now if you look, the side dimensions are okay. The problem is, look at top and bottom. Total mess, right? So how do I get top and bottom to look reasonable? Squeeze it side to side, do the same thing. I'll squeeze it this way, preen all that material up, and I will use my fingers as basically a cutting guide. Okay, so now we're starting to get a little closer. Same thing, squeeze it, preen all that material.
we're, we're a little bit closer. Um, let's just see. Um, okay, so I, I don't think there are any questions, but again, guys, you're, you're welcome to do it. So now we're sort of getting it. I mean, it, it's not pretty, but it's kind of within the ballpark. You can't even see the eyes. Now what I'll do is I'll start getting a little more aggressive. So I want to expose the eyes. I don't want to take out all that material because that creates my transition. So I'll trim it this way, get a little bit of that material. This is what I call advanced barbershop technique. Probably half you guys are like me. Your hair was get the hair that you have remaining was getting long. I had to have my wife cut it with my uh, razor the other day. So I told her I'm very experienced at trimming. I just do it with synthetic materials. Still have that eye a little bit obscured. So I might fold back some of those materials and trim it out. Okay, so now you guys can probably see, maybe there's a little bit there. The eyes are now exposed. Now what I like to do is put it back in the vise. It really helps to have a rotary vise, but you can do all this stuff by hand. And just start using your rotary vise to even all this stuff out. You go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. These John, are good. We had one question. Somebody asked uh, what scissors you like for cutting the synthetic material. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that pretty much I get asked all the time. These scissors are um, German. They're made by a company, I think, named Solingen uh, or Engels. Basically, you need, first of all, they need to be serrated to cut the, the synthetic material because they need to grab onto the material. If you took a very sharp pair of unserrated scissors, you'd be doing this. You'd just be sliding right off it. The little serrations on both sides of these work. These are Solingen's, but in general, you want... Um, preferably like maybe five inch scissors that are serrated. Um, most fly shops sell some high end, either Italian or German scissors. Those are the ones you want to get. Now they're expensive. You know, they might cost 50 bucks. There are some that cost more, but I, I've been using these without sharpening them for about 10 years. So I used to buy Dr. Slicks and they wouldn't last me a season um, of this stuff. In any event, as you can see, we're getting rid of a lot of this stuff and we're starting to get the shape of a proper squid. Now, what I also like to do is I will take the fly out of the vise and come in from behind. So if I think there's too much material, I'll trim it. And there's, by the way, there is no template. I've had people say, can you trim backwards, forwards? What's your technique? Your technique is whatever you develop. If anyone ever tells you there's only one way to do any fly tying procedure, there's wrong. They're wrong. I remember when I was a kid, I learned to tie from tying books and I'd be like, oh my God, I don't have the proper color of CLX dubbing to tie, tie this caddis emerger. Or Lefty Cray says I need to use this kind of saddle hackles and I only have neck hackles. All materials are game. Things that are meant for spay flies are great for striper flies. Things that are great for little tiny trout flies can be great for billfish flies. It's all learning what materials work. But if you look, what I'm doing, we're basically finished. I've kind of created that conical shape of a squid. And you can go crazy here. You don't want them too thick because they'll have a little trouble sinking. And this is not a particularly large squid, but check out that spread on the back of that. I mean, that's gonna move great, right? So if Anthony's in the canal and he has stripers kind of sneaking into the shallow water in front of him, you don't want a squid that's gonna dive bomb to the bottom. You want it scooching along, you know, in that first, I, I like to fish with an intermediate line, particularly with squid. I love them when they're creeping a foot under the surface or, or not even. Um, and they, they, they will just get uh, hammered. So that's pretty much the squid fly. So I don't know, we took, yeah, we took the better part of, I don't know, 45 minutes to tie that sucker, but it won't take you that. The first time you tie it, it'll take you an hour and a half and you'll throw it away and you'll get the razor blade. But trust me, once you get used to this trimming process and the application process, and I use that same technique of those V ties for every style of kinky muddler. Basically, it's the reason I call it a kinky muddler, it's the equivalent of a muddler minnow with spun deer hair. But unlike spun deer hair, it's translucent. It's not buoyant the way deer hair is. When you crank down on deer hair, right, it goes perpendicular to the hook shank. I didn't want that. I wanted everything to sweep back. So if I'm making a bait fish, and let's say there's the head and there's the saddle hackles, I want it all to flow gently. I don't want any 
um, gulfs and valleys. I want that smooth profile. And there you have that smooth profile. And you know, this is not the greatest resolution, but I think you guys can kind of see how we got that shape. And I can, you know, I put it in this way. I say, oh, look, there's a little, I like to, by the way, one, one funny, one little piece of advice is when you tie flies with dense heads, that's always a good, um, mechanically, you want to have some soft materials in the back because the water's going to sweep over and make this tail part kick. Let's say you're tying a bunker and you want the back to wiggle. But what I've noticed with Kinky Mothers, this was pointed out to me in the Everglades by a guide, is when I make the very nose of the fly kind of pointy rather than super round, they just seem to bob and weave pretty nicely in the water. So there goes that squid. And if one of you guys were here, I'd be happy to hand it to you. Um, and tell you to go catch a stripe with it. If you look at the one that Anthony has, Anthony, can you hold up the one you have? Or this one. So you can see, for example, the one Anthony has is a little more like this one where the tentacles are actually fairly narrowly um, cupped in towards each other. This one, I spread them a lot because what's gonna happen is as you pull this through the water, they're gonna narrow down like that then you pause and they're gonna flare out, which is just what, exactly what squid do. Squid also, remember, can go frontwards and backwards, right? They, they, they move by squirting water out of this part of their body. They have a little thing called a, basically a beak, um, but what that is is that's like an internal shell. So that's a kinky muddler squid. And um, let's see, does anyone have any specific questions? Doesn't look like it. Um, we can open up the floor. I, I, how long do you usually do these things, Anthony? Uh, as long as you want to, John, it's up to you. Um, I don't know, you did it's, such a great job explaining everything every step of the way. I mean, it's kind of, uh, I'm not surprised there are any questions, to be honest with you. Uh, um, I could, well, so it's up to you guys. We could just talk about it or I could tie another fly. Maybe we could take a vote. Um, would you like to see, I had planned to do either a squid or one of these little tube bait fish. So these are great for trout. They're for bass. They're for albies stripers, pike. So this gentleman with the beard who is going like this, I think, uh, unmute him so I know, so I can say hi to him. Hey, I muted everybody. On, you're on live Zoom. What's your name, sir? I'm Sean, I just said tie it up. <laughs> tie it up, okay. So, so um, why don't we do that? It'll show you some additional techniques and I'll show you how little material um, you can use. So Sean, you didn't have a particular question? No, I was just voting for tie. Okay, we'll, we'll do a little too. And this one will be fast. Although once I get going. So why don't you uh, mute John again? And... Sorry, were you uh, indicating yep. something? You're all set. I just had to unmute you again, but you're good okay. now. Yep, all set. Somebody asked what material was used in the in the tentacles. We had done that in the beginning, but the tentacles are hackles from the end of a dry fly neck. You can use saddles or any kind of feathers and have some craft fur under it. And then I had this stuff called uh, Senyo's Predator Wrap. So you can actually see some great videos. Go onto YouTube and do long fin squid. And you'll see videos of, of squid swimming along, then they'll stop and all of a sudden the tentacles will go out like that and then they'll taper back. They're unbelievably interesting creatures. So we're gonna tie something like this. This fly, when you see how it's tied, is all head. There's almost no mass to this fly. It's all head and then just a little bit of wing. So I'll show you how to do that. So what we're gonna do is, we take another kind of tube fly doohickey. So one of the best things about tube flies is if you like toys, there are a million of them. So this particular tube fly, also made by Pro Sport Fisher, if you guys can see it, it's a little plastic tube, but it's got a little lip here, and then these little, um, I guess I'd call them teeth, to hold on to this thing. This thing is what we call a hook guide. It's a little silicone flexible tube that you actually feed your tippet material through the hole in the tube. You tie your hook on, I'll show you guys, right? You tie your hook on, you feed your tippet material through this thing, you tie your hook onto this hook, that's an Arex stinger hook, and then you pull it into that little silicone flexible tube called the hook guide. 
Why does that work? Because now I have a nice long fly. That's pretty long for a trout fly, right? Like four inches plus. But I don't have to use a super long shank hook. Trout sometimes like to nip at flies from the side or the back. I have the hook all the way back here, but look at how flexible it is. There's no, there's no leverage of, of a long shank hook for the fish to throw it. So that's one of my favorite things about tube flies beyond the, some of the other flexibilities I'm gonna show you. So we got a needle in the vise. This is a tapered flat needle that I jam the materials on. So I'm gonna take this silicone hook guide. By the way, I hated tube flies until I discovered this pro sport fisher stuff. It, it, this stuff works for all species of fly. I've caught tons of smallmouth on these tubes. Put that little silicone thingy on, then I'm putting on what's called a nanotube, which has these little teeth. I'm gonna fit the silicone guide on. And that one's orange, they come in all kinds of colors. And after you've tied the fly, you can swap out. You want a little orange belly, you want a black belly, you want a clear belly, you could put it. There are also, let me show you guys, a million doohickeys that you can fit on these. Um, this is just a box of silliness. So we've got metal beads. We've got these little round tungsten beads that are incredibly heavy. That tiny little tungsten bead is like, uh, uh, the weight of, of large uh, dumbbell lines. We've got these little metal bullet weights that I can, that add some weight that work as spreaders. We have little cones that fit over them. This is a cone that actually has, oops, has um, holes in it so that the water will flow through and make the materials kick. Um, it's kind of endless what you can put on these things. Here are different, there are traditional cones, you know, like we'd all see on your, you know, whatever, your typical cone head freshwater streamer. Um, there are these cones which have this funny recessed shape. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's kind of scooped out. That also affects the behavior. So I, I'm not doing this to advertise this, uh, but you know, I, I am associated with that company, but I'm telling you, if you have any interest in tube flies, this is the way to go. So I like with tubes, since they're hollow, to have a little weight in them. I'm gonna use a tiny little tungsten weight. You guys can't see it, but that's like about the size that you'd have on a trout size bead. We're gonna attach, I'll use uh, mono for this again. Um, I was about to use my scissors, but I'm violating my promise just to break it off that way. Now what we'll do is, I don't have, I like to usually have some fox fur for the belly, some kind of collar there. It's gonna be spread by that bead. I have a, a, a tan saddle here. I'm gonna look at the back of the saddle. Looks to me like there are some schlappany type feathers. You can use marabou. See, I got this off the back of the saddle. What I'll do is I'll strip that back. I'll tie it in. And by the way, I change the, the sequence of this pattern all the time, but we'll do it. In other words, the, the next time I tie this, I might be differently. So I tied it in by the tip. What I'll do is I'll take a few thread wraps forward, then I will take that tip and fold it back on itself. That way, if you ever, you guys ever tied in a, a hackle, fur, whatever, and it pulls right out after you tie it in, if you tie it in and fold it back on itself, it'll stay much better. And often, you don't need scissors, and you can just break it off like that. So what we'll do is we will take this, you know, it's essentially schlopping or a webby saddle, get that out of the way. And we'll tie a little throat collar. You know, I'm sure you guys have seen people fold thread feathers. So in other words, when I wrap it forward, right, rather than just wrapping it like this, I grab the fibers and preen them back. But I'm not too compulsive about it because I always have my tying thread to wrap back on it. And this will give us a little bit lighter colored belly. Now you see there's some marabou-y stuff there at the end. There's no reason not to use that if you want to. I probably have enough there because this is a fly where I'm gonna to try to keep the material sparse. Turn that off. Get rid of that. So now that's a big mess. All you need to do is fold it back and wrap on itself. Now you have a nice collar, right? So I could have worried about it, but I have a perfect little collar. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a two-part wing. I'm gonna take some more craft fur. Fox fur is killer for this. Um, also, I don't, I don't know if any of you guys have tied with this stuff called uh, um, uh, squimpish flies, uh, squimpish fibers. It's a killer. I think I have one here. I might have shown it in the beginning. There you go. This is that fly, and all this is is squimpish fibers. 
There's um, no, no weight to it. It's very translucent. It swims great, doesn't hold water, a collar and a head. But I'm gonna use, because I didn't bring any squimfish flies, uh, fibers with me, take some graft fur. Now this could be a little different than what we did on the squid. Whereas on the squid, I deliberately left in a lot of underfur. I took out some of this underfur and I made it surround the shank 360. Not gonna do that this time. I want the craft fur just to be the dorsal part of the fly. Remember, it's almost an empty fly. It's gonna have a wing and a head. The throat is gonna be kind of empty and the hook is gonna be sticking down there. So I'll take that craft fur. I'll surround it, if you guys can see, just three, um, uh, 180 degrees, not 360 degrees, right? And because I had that little bead in there, you'll notice that it's uh, propped up a little bit, but craft fur is very pliable stuff. What I like to do over the craft fur, let me uh, see what other materials I have here, is I like to put some kind of feather. Here's a cool looking feather. This is, um, this is a brown, I think they call this a freshwater streamer cape, but I like the brown grizzly. If you, a lot of freshwater bait fish, like I fish up, I don't know if any of you guys fish up in the Delaware River system, but I fish up there a lot. And when I'm not fishing dry flies, I'll sometimes fish streamers. There are a lot of chubs in that water. And the chubs are, um, have kind of a brownish bronzy back. So what you'll do is you'll take a feather from either side of this neck, not too long. These feathers are kind of short and squat. So I don't want them too long because I don't want them too squat. I don't want them to interrupt the profile of the fly. But this should do it. And I'm going to tie them in in a way that I call tented. This is like an old Atlantic salmon fly tires. So if you guys ever tied a tarpon, an old fashioned tarpon fly, you'd have them angling out from each other. If you tie a deceiver, you have them praying hand style. I'm not going to do either of those. And I'm not going to do it as a flat wing either. I'm going to tie them at 45 degree angles. So I'm going to go here, wet that grapper down, angle it at 45 degrees, so it's angled towards me, and tie it down with maybe one, two wraps. Simple wraps, right? No pressure. Why am I doing that? Because I want to create that little dome, that little dorsal shape of a bait fish. Same deal on the other side. I'm not tying on top, I'm not tying on the side. I'm going to do it kind of, you know, in other words, if you're looking at a clock, you're kind of at uh, like 10.30 and 1.30. Tie it in that way. And then look at how cool that looks. Um, the one that I just had out, if you look at this, I don't know if you guys could see it, but it's really got the shape of a bait fish, right? It's not flat, it's got that nicely tapered shape. So, got those suckers tied in there. Yes, it's tented. I think uh, somebody named Emil said uh, it's tented and that's exactly right. Um, uh, you know, you'll see that a lot in steelhead flies. And I just love the way that, that those two feathers, which don't create much mass or casting problem, create that nice darker back, and then you have that lighter colored craft fur bleeding through. And usually in front of this, I like to wrap some kind of collar. So let's find some other fun. I got it. I'll show you guys one of the coolest feathers known to man. I just got this actually from the Bears Den last week. This is called a Coq de Leon hen saddle. And this is like a soft tackle feather with very long webby uh, fibers. And it's modeled, so it just, it just looks great for bait fish. Let me just show you how wide those fibers are. But here's the cool thing. Unlike uh, a, a schloppen, schloppen fibers tend to mat together. These suckers want to separate. And that makes it, it's almost like a giant partridge feather. If any of you have ever tied like, you know, a partridge in orange. Um, so I'll tie that in again by the tip, right? One, two, three. I'll fold the tip back on itself so that it doesn't slip out. One, two, three. I'll break off that tip and then we'll wrap this. So remember, what did we have? We had the schlappen, which added the throat. We had the craft fur and the, and the feathers on top. And now we're wrapping a collar in front of the whole sucker. So this will look like maybe a little chub, a little darter, um, or even a baby brown trout. You know, big, big, browns like to eat small browns. And um, on the Delaware, I'm convinced that some of the bigger brown trout that I've caught have been, um, you know, cannibals. Get out some of that. I don't want too much of that webby uh, marabou stuff. Tie that in. And I think that that's an amazingly cool little collar. 
it breaks up the color. And there we go. So that's the whole back half of the fly. And now what we're gonna do, here you can use comb to get that stuff up. Now what we're gonna do, we have very little left to do with this fly. We're just gonna do the head kinky muddler style. So what we'll do is, once again, let me see what materials I have here. Um, we will just use this, uh, I know what we'll do. We'll do a two colored head. So what we'll do is we'll take some of this rusty brown that matches the, um, it matches the, 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 the hackles that I put on the back, right? Same color. And I'll do that same V type, but I'm gonna use a very small amount of material. Can you guys see? I'm just tying it in like this, one, two, and this, one, two. Now I'm gonna get some white stuff. This is the same material, sculpting flash fiber, but just in a white. And this stuff takes markers really well. Fold it over on itself so I have enough volume. Snip it. Flip it over in a vise. Remember, I don't want to. I don't want to end up cutting off this collar, so I'm just going to do a little short piece right there. One, two. Hold it back. Three, four. Do the same thing on the top. Make sure not to do that. One, two. One, two. And then I'm gonna show you a really neat trick that is gonna introduce you to yet another doohickey from the, <laughs> from the pro sport fisher stuff. One, two. One, two. Okay, now we've got that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this stuff and we're just gonna do the top and bottom procedure we did before. In other words, we're not gonna fold it back. Take that, tie it on the top. One, two. Take this white stuff. Oops. Try not to cut your thread. That's a good thing to do. I promised you I would cut my thread at some point, but we can we can rescue this. It doesn't look like anything came down. Tie it back on. Rack it back on itself. We're all good. Miraculous recovery. So I'll take this material. I'm not even going to bother to uh, worry about cutting it. I've got it all looped. That's okay. We'll cut it out in a minute. Take this white stuff. Cut it out in a minute. Get rid of that. Now, before, if you remember, I folded this stuff back and trimmed it. Pro Sport Fisher makes these very cool things. Some of you guys have probably seen these things that Flyman makes called, uh, what do they call them? fish masks, I think. Fish skulls, they're little plastic heads you slide on. Pro Sport Fisher has its own version called a soft head. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it is a clear head that can slide on. What is really cool about this is it's flexible, so it'll conform to the shape of the head, and it's actually made of intermediate fly line material. So what I will do is I'll use that to push the material back. So I'll get this out of the way. I don't even need a spreader, right? Just get in front of there. We'll worry about fixing that all up later. One, two. And what I'm gonna use to hold that material in shape and help me trim it is I'm gonna take this little soft head, slide it on here, and jam it on like that. And that is gonna let me tie my kinky mother head. It's also gonna make it incredibly durable. So I will take some super glue. A little blob right there. That was actually more than I intended to. Uh, let's see if we can reduce that just a little bit. Maybe paint some of it into the material. 360. There we go. And by the way, you use super glue gel. And I'm going to use this to hold all that material back. I'll angle it up, push it on, and hold it. That won't come off. Now, what you ultimately will do is you'll trim that off and you'll take a lighter and burn the lip back, but, um, or I don't have a lighter with me. But what I'll do is, that's, on, that's glued on there pretty well. Um, see how I left like a little nib there? What I would do typically is take a lighter and just hold the blue part of the flame to it and it'll fold back on itself, but it won't occlude 
the hole. So now I have this big messy head. And all I need to do is, rather than worrying about pinching with my hands, I've already got the template for trimming this material off. Make sure I preen out the synthetic stuff, right? So I don't cut off the collar. And I trim it right along there so it conforms exactly to the top half of that. This is a much easier trimming job than on the squid. Same thing on the bottom. John, you ever fish this fly for Albies? Um, I haven't. Other people have. I mean, it looks perfect, right? Because it's like makes a great little bay anchovy. What I like to do is I don't want to trim off that nice uh, hen saddle that I put in there. So again, I will fit my thread in and cut around to establish where the back half of the head ends. But yeah, Anthony, like a little three incher, two and a half incher with a light tan over white, be perfect. And the good thing about it is this um, sculpting flash stuff is really um, translucent. And you know how bay anchovies are, I mean, when albies are on bay anchovies, you pretty much, that's one of the more selective saltwater fish situations. You pretty much have to fit something that looks like, like a bay anchovy in size and color. Yeah, we're basically done with this fly. But for some reason, something about the layout of this fly, bass just love it. I, I, was, I happen to be in Maine now. There's a bass lake up here. I was throwing this thing um, against the bank. It's, it was really funny. These guys are having a jam session on an island in this big lake called McGunticook. I went over to check it out, and then I thought, hey, you know, right in front of their house, it looks kind of fishy. I threw one of these flies in, and I hooked a fish, and I thought, what is this? Because I was in a water master, and it was just towing me around. I couldn't move the fish. It was an enormous largemouth bass. Literally, it towed me around in circles for like five minutes um, on one of these things. So just make sure that you trim to conform to where your collar is. You don't want stuff sticking up. Then you just glue eyes in. And you're done with that fly. By the way, these, um, we don't need to do it now, but these uh, soft heads have little sockets for the eyes. Just put a little glue in. And then I usually coat over the whole head with this glue called liquid fusion, which is, uh, you know, I'm a glueaholic. But what a cool little bait fish, right? Perfect profile, swims great. Then what you do is you take your two flags. So I, so look. To give you a sense of, and by the way, I'll show you one other thing, how easily this takes marker. So I like the Copic markers, but you can use anything uh, you want. Let's say I wanted the top of this to be olive. So you see it's got that brown color, but there's a lot, a lot of bait fish that have kind of an olive brown. Okay, now it's olive brown. And let's say, have you noticed how a lot of bait fish, this is particularly so in saltwater, like bunker, have like a little yellow, orangey, purpley stuff on their sides. Take the Copic marker, do a little swipe here. Can you guys see that little that little cheek right there? Um, I don't think I have a red marker, um, but you know sometimes people like to do the bleeding gills. But there you have it. So I don't know. We spent a long time on the other fly. That was more like a ten minute fly. Um, so finally, just again to rig this sucker, you feed the the line through it. And here's a, here's a tube fly hook. This is a little, I think, partridge tube single. Look at how short that shank is. That's, if that thing gets seeded in a fish's mouth, it's not coming out. Whereas if you had a long shank hook, what you do is it's gonna fit right into, sorry, it's gonna fit right into that little gasketing thing right there. And what's really cool about this, right, is sometimes the Delaware gets flooded after a big rain. And I wanna throw these suckers right up on the bank so literally you have, let's say a grass bank and then a drop off. When the river's blown out and muddy, the fish like to hang tight to the banks, right? You've all fished an undercut bank. I can turn this hook upright. So it's actually hook up and it's peeking through there. And now I can throw this fly right onto the bank and it's not gonna catch because the hook is facing up. It's not gonna catch on the grass, pull it off the edge of the bank. And when it falls there, wham. On a version of this fly, although that was not a tube fly, it was a jointed fly, I caught a brown trout on the Delaware that was 25 measured inches and so big, I'd put it in like the eight or nine pound range. 
So that, I caught a 20 inch rainbow that day, a measured 20 inch rainbow. And there's no question that this brown trout could have eaten that rainbow. No, without, I'm sure this, this, this fish hadn't eaten a bug in 10 years. Had big scars over it, it was an amazing fish. But, so that's my presentation. Um, I think that's a pretty neat looking little critter right there. And that is a nothing, for, that's much easier to tie than squid fly. But my point here was just to show you that using these materials and tying them in that kinky mother style, you can create heads, bodies. I've tied crayfish, lobsters, American eels. I do skinny ones for sand eels. Just a great way of, of, of you know, you've seen things that have trimmed wool, trimmed uh, deer hair. I think these synthetics give you all kinds of options for having a really cool trimmed fly. And there you have it. So let's see. I don't think anyone else has any questions, but I'm happy to open it up. But we've been at it for an hour and 15. So two well, flies in and out. I just want to say thank you, John, from the Bears Den and everybody here. It was, uh, it was really awesome, everything, uh, everything you showed us. And uh, I'm sure most of us will put it to it. All right. It sounds like it's, uh, I think we're all set, right, Anthony? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, John. That was awesome. Okay, Thank you. Thanks, guys. You, you guys can find me on Instagram if you ever, Johnny Z King, if you have any questions, just shoot me a private message and I'll try to help out. And I'm, I'm always signing at the Bears Den at the shows and I'm sure I'll be up there sooner rather than later. It's my favorite shop, best fly shop in America.